Well, thanks again, everybody, for coming to this. I have dedicated uh, this presentation to everyone in America, um, also all the YouTubers and the researchers out there and my friends and people who sent me emails. Everybody was talking about Sandy Hook for a while. It has quieted down, but it tends to surface Again, from time to time, there's all kinds of new legislation that is brought out that is being considered and then finalized. So thank you for being awake. And this presentation is entitled Unraveling Sandy Hook in Two, Three, Four, and Five Dimensions. bit of a problem believing that somebody who's 150 to 160 pounds uh, drove to the school dressed in all black wearing a mask got out of his vehicle in the parking lot and strapped 40 plus pounds of weapons and ammunition and armor to his body and walked up to whatever point of entry he used to enter the school without any video surveillance taking place i find it very unlikely that an awkward mentally ill 20 year old kid with limited training, was able to accomplish all of this on his own at random, okay? And the reason why I say this, Sean, is because I do a lot of SWAT training. My friends do a lot of SWAT training. Uh, a lot of guys that are working on SWAT or a an equivalent unit, um, they're firearms trainers. And the most, I'm 5'9", I'm about 200 pounds. I'm in really good shape. Uh, I train a lot, I shoot a lot, and when I'm wearing full body armor, uh, the most I can carry on me is, is a rifle with about 12 or 13 magazines and one pistol. They're basically saying that this kid is about anywhere between 50 and 50 like a hell of a lot less training, carried double the load that I would carry, and basically did all of this damage at random without having ever been seen surveilling the school or, uh, you know, it, it, it just, it just it's just highly unlikely. And again, it needs to be stressed, no video or photographic evidence supporting anything that would indicate that this young person of, of that build that you described carried this off on his own. Nothing at all to support it in any way. And again, who were the three men who were detained? Who were the three men? Who were those guys? What, what sort of magical powers do they have to be detained and then just get to disappear after one of the most heinous school massacres in U.S. history? We have not been told that any picture images or video footage was obtained of the incident by law enforcement. And to date, I have not seen a single crime scene photograph of the inside or the outside of that school. I have not seen a single crime scene photograph of the inside or the outside of that school. The guy in the video says, I have not seen a single crime scene photo, but you can fill in the blank. A single child's body, blood stain, devastated parent. There are many seriously missing pieces to what happened at Sandy Hook, and they do not seem to be showing up. They should have been there that day. Instead, other pieces were there, departures from what would have been normal in such a situation. 300 years ago, Sandy Hook was a tiny mill town on the Putatuck River, built within Newtown in Fairfield County, Connecticut. Today, Newtown is a bedroom community or a commuter town for people who work in the bigger coastal cities of Stamford, Bridgeport, Fairfield, Norwalk, and even Manhattan. Sandy Hook is a very small part of Newtown on the other side of Interstate 84. 
One visitor described it as a place that you could cover on foot in 30 minutes. Fairfield County today is one of the most affluent places to live in America. It has trendy shops and restaurants and new housing subdivisions. My first job was in Fairfield County. I used to live on the state line between New York and Southern Connecticut, where Westchester County meets Fairfield. I would run and ride my bike for miles on beautiful country roads flanked by the low stone walls and rolling meadows of huge estates with long driveways up to houses that were turreted like castles. Fairfield County has since changed. New wealth has come in with new faces, new ethnicities, and new names. The old wealth of the original New England blue bloods, you might call them, is being replaced by the new generations of a new dynasty. Those who succeeded in the mercantile trades in New York City moved out of the boroughs of Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Queens to raise children in the suburbs who would grow up to be doctors, lawyers, and brokers on Wall Street. Nassau County on Long Island was their first destination. Westchester County, just north of the Bronx, was the next. And the last and most coveted place to live in was Fairfield, Connecticut, with its old money, rolling hills, and sumptuous estates, many of which have been chopped into smaller tracts now, with garish homes built right along the roadside to show status. New England, Connecticut being its southernmost state, has also always had a working class, salt-of-the-earth people whose forebears were the militiamen of the American Revolution. The rivers, harbors, and natural resources of Connecticut and its many inventors turned it from farming toward manufacturing, and by the late 1800s, with the advent of the assembly line, Connecticut was known worldwide for its precision workmanship. Pistols for the U.S. government were supplied by America's first gun manufacturers in Middletown. Home to Colt and Remington, Connecticut was where the American firearms industry was born. And in Newtown itself, you will find the National Shooting Sports Foundation headquarters, one of the largest gun lobbies in the country. And that is the reality that brings us to the story of a village in a town with a school that saw a shooting catastrophe one week before the solstice of solstices in December 2012. Some of you may already know a lot about the anomalies of Sandy Hook. So to keep it interesting, I'm going to take a different tack. The story created by and in our media has so many inconsistencies that one has to seriously question the skills of those in the media, or one has to ask how such conflicting reports could emerge from one true story. And one has to ask how such reported events could take place in a physical world that can't accommodate the things that supposedly occurred at Sandy Hook. For instance, a lightweight 20-year-old youth carrying multiple firearms, managing them, changing magazines, and accurately, consecutively shooting 26 people between 3 and 11 times each in a matter of 5 to 7 minutes. Men who are much bigger with extensive weapons experience and proficient shooting skills say they themselves could have hardly done what Adam Lanza did. A little target practice with mom does not produce 26 victims in 5 to 7 minutes. The Sandy Hook story, delivered by way of television news, television interviews, and print media, exists in what I will call two dimensions, the flat world of printed paper and the screen. It is a vibrant, noisy, and colorful world that feels and looks real, and we've been trained since childhood to connect with, to be stimulated by, and to be informed by this 2D world. The story in 2D can take on all kinds of flavors, our larger-than-life big-screen movies bring us closer than we could ever be in real life to looming characters and their situations. The person projected on this screen is much larger than real life. We allow 2D stories to have tremendous impact on us. They are made with tools and technologies, and we know very well that they are staged. They are created as simulations of reality, and we enjoy them fully for that. We participate in the fiction by suspending our active awareness of it and getting into the story. But when we finish watching a movie on television and switch to the news, we ingest those stories in a different way from the film we just saw. We separate the news from the movie. When we turn the channel on the TV, we also turn the channel in our brains. 
However, news footage is edited just like film footage is. Editing is really piecing a story together to make it clear and efficient. In movie making, scenes do not have to be shot in sequence. The story is written or created, then it's filmed, and then it's put together in the editing room in a way that feels rich and real. The physical world, the space we occupy, is what I will call 3D. It has certain rules. Big, small, heavy, light, dark, wet, night, day. The Sandy Hook Elementary School is a place you can visit today. It's on the map. You can walk up to the fence that blocks it off. You can take a picture of it. So it exists in the third dimension. An event the size of Sandy Hook involving multiple people and injuries is known in emergency talk as an MCI or mass casualty incident. Sandy Hook was an MCI. A bus turning over is an MCI. When first responders arrive at an MCI, they use a protocol that is known worldwide as START triage. Triage means to sort. START stands for simple triage and rapid treatment. Accident victims are assessed by physical presentation, breathing, vital signs, coherence, the ability to stand or walk, and they're tagged. Red, which means they need immediate treatment. Yellow, delayed. Green, minor and black would be deceased. Victims are put on colored tarps and transported from the scene in that order. Here are start triage tarps and an example of the tag which is put around the neck or a limb. While we did see start tarps on the day of Sandy Hook, they were empty. The white mounds you see in these pictures are actually emergency gear. Ambulance crews learned that no bodies were coming out. They would be kept in the building to which only the police had access. Ambulances were made to wait down the street at the firehouse. This is what was posted on an internet forum about the emergency response at Sandy Hook. I'm going to read it to you. The main sticking point is the EMS services did not behave within their normal scope. A mass shooting would have had trauma helicopters flying children out one after another, performing CPR the entire way to the hospital, and patients would be declared dead at the hospital after extensive measures were taken to try to save lives. I've been in the ER for five years, and we get all code blue patients. We get 80-year-old nursing home patients that have not been breathing for 20 minutes, with no chance of survival and we perform CPR and necessary medical intervention with the chance that patients may regain a pulse. A few months ago, I had a conversation with a couple of EMTs. They told me everybody uses start triage when there's an MCI. They told me in exactly these words, the police cannot pronounce people dead. We can't pronounce anyone dead unless they're decapitated, and it's totally obvious. We have to take everyone to the hospital that's where they pronounce them dead. The police don't have the authority. We don't have the authority. Dr. H. Wayne Carver has been Connecticut's chief medical examiner since 1989. The Office of the Chief Medical Examiner is an independent agency that investigates sudden, unexpected, or violent deaths in the state of Connecticut. Thousands of people have seen the interview Dr. Carver did for the press on December 15th just after the shootings occurred. James Tracy, a media studies professor at Florida Atlantic University, wrote an article about this interview that went viral. What he noticed immediately was Dr. Carver's strange behavior, reflecting discomfort, nervousness, and even a bizarre lack of knowledge of what he had just done, which was to personally examine the Sandy Hook bodies. Listen to how he talks. I've been at this for a third of a century. Uh, and it's my sensibilities may not be the average man uh, but this probably is the worst I have seen or uh, the worst uh, that I know of any of my colleagues having seen and uh, that all the more makes me uh, uh, proud and, and grateful to our staff who uh, to a man have, uh, have just behaved uh, most professionally uh, uh, and, and strongly and um, I hope uh, 
I hope they and I hope uh, the people of Newtown uh, don't have a crash on their head later. But. Doctor, 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 on that, on that examination, did you tell which caliber of the handgun compared to the rifle of his uh, shooting pistols were on, on, on the incident? Uh, it's a good thing it's not being prosecution because then I couldn't answer that. But uh, all the wounds that I know of at this point were caused by the uh, the long the long weapon. So the, so the rifle was the primary weapon? Yes. And what caliber were the bullets? Uh, the question was what caliber were these bullets? And I know, I probably know more about firearms than most pathologists, but if I say it in court, they yell at me and don't make me answers. So I'll let the police uh, 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 deal with that for you. Uh, Doctor, Doctor, can you tell the, uh, about the nature of the wounds? Were they, were they at very close range? Were the children shot from across the room? Did you tell them? Um... I only did seven of the autopsies. The victims I had ranged from three to 11 wounds apiece, and I only saw two of them with close-range shooting. Uh, but that's a, you know that's a sample. I really don't have detailed information on the rest of the the injuries. But you said it was the long rifle that was used. Yes. Did you shoot? The long rifle was, was discovered in the car. That's not correct. It's not correct, sir. Follow up on that question. How many bullets, uh, Casey, did you find total on the autopsy? Oh, I'm lucky I can tell you how many I found. Uh, I don't know. There were lots of them. Okay. What time? What shape were the bodies of the families of the last four Uh, we did not bring the bodies and the families into contact. We took uh, pictures of them. Um, of, of their facial features, you have uh, uh, it's it's easier on the families when you do that. Uh, there is uh, a time and a place for up close and personal in the grieving process. But to accomplish this, uh, we felt it would be best uh, to do it this way. And uh, you can sort of uh, you can control the situation uh, depending on your photographer. And I have very good photographers. What did Dr. Carver mean by, I hope they and I hope the people of Newtown don't have it crash on their head later? And why was it decided that the parents would not be permitted to physically identify their dead children, which is an extreme departure not only from protocol, but from instinctive parental behavior and nature? It is unthinkable to most parents to simply be told by authorities that their child was in a massacre and is never coming back. Wouldn't parents want to see the red jacket, the blue pants, the little blonde head, the pink sneakers, regardless of the injuries, just to make sure? We had empty triage mats and a glimpse of one huge body bag thought to be too large for any reported victim of the shooting. So I decided to look for, besides just names, verifiable victims. Here's a compilation of footage of one woman on a gurney. Okay, who was he getting in the trying to see you? Okay, is that you? Don't touch the back. Right here. Uh, Susan Candiotti is on the scene for us as well. Susan, are you getting more information on what happened? Ken Pierce? Keith, I can, yeah. Okay, what can you tell us about what's going on uh, at that firehouse right yeah, now? I'm with you right now. All right. This, this is as far as we can go. Obviously, they've got the yellow tape set up right here. Okay. Behind the camera there, Kevin Flommer is taking you along as uh, you see one of the injured people. I didn't get a look at the kind of injuries we're talking about here, but uh, that is one of the few casualties we've seen so far. Anos que foi morto na operação policial. Ele também teria matado o pai em casa e a mãe na escola onde ela trabalhava. No local da tragédia, o desespero era grande. Okay, now watch those keys. Taking them out of her pocket. So now let's listen to Fire Chief Halstead. It's a call he'll never forget. Sandy Hook Fire Chief Bill Halstead says he was told there's a shooting at the school and it's not good. I, I happen to be here when a call came in. Actually, I heard a lot of sirens. He came out of the firehouse and saw an EMT motion for help with a wounded woman. And the lady had a, uh, a hand injury and, and I think it was her thigh. And, um, and she wanted me to help her get out of the car. So I, you know, I helped the lady get out of the car and we put her on the, 
the stretcher and got her in the ambulance. They set up triage for more victims. We were set and we got to treat one lady. Uh, another lady came out uh, uh, with a gunshot wound. The survivors filed out of the school. His ex-wife was one of them who hid in a closet for hours, but they waited on the walking wounded. No one came. I got word out that we would, um, no one else would be coming out of the building. Okay. I helped the lady get out of her car, says the fire chief. So this woman drove in her own car with gunshot wounds from the Sandy Hook shooting. Just keep that in mind. MSNBC reports that only two people survived. And we learned that assistant principal Natalie Hammond, who seems to have made an astonishing recovery, was one of them. There were only two people who were shot that day in that school who were not killed. Only two people injured and not killed. Both of them were hit at that point in the attack, that initial point. One teacher who was in a meeting room with the principal and the psychologist was hit by a ricochet bullet from that initial onslaught of gunfire. She was wounded in the leg, but she crawled back into the meeting room and she called 911. ER doctor William Begg was on duty at Danbury Hospital, and Danbury was designated by the state to handle MCIs. Danbury Hospital, I want you to know, was only 12 miles from Sandy Hook. I would like to um, ask you this question. Did you actually treat Sandy Hook victims? Uh, yes. I was I was I was in the ER that day when the when the victims came in. Can you describe the kinds of wounds and the number of bullets in these small bodies? There's privacy rules and HIPAA and and just that, that prevent me from actually detailing the the type of wounds. Um, but. but most of the most of the, the the victims actually didn't come in, and we have such horrific injuries to little bodies. That's what happens. They can't. They don't even make it to the hospital. Okay, so I'll say it again. Danbury Hospital was only 12 miles from Sandy Hook, and though the sirens went off at 9:35 and there were ambulances galore, we learned from the Huffington Post that only three victims arrived at the hospital at 10.30, a whole hour of delay. Why did it take one hour to transport three victims, only 12 miles? The only other report of an actual victim I was able to find is this one, posted on December 15th. Chris Vadas, resident of Sandy Hook, and also an off-duty Reading police officer, carries a limp injured boy into a waiting ambulance at the firehouse. So there are the three victims. Let's look at the strangely complacent, even smiling parents who were showing a whole new kind of grief after the deaths of their children. Skepticism rang loud and long all across the internet. How could anyone believe these parents had lost their six-year-olds? They did not act devastated. Where was the outrage at the failure of the recently ramped up school security system to stop or even capture video of the person who got into the school. Visitors to Sandy Hook after the shooting saw a camera on the wall at the entrance, but on the day of the shooting, it wasn't there. So where you see the yellow arrow is the camera after December 14. And then in the news shooting, where you see the circle, there is no camera. We were told about other suspects running through the woods that morning, one heading straight for the Masonic Lodge, only a kangaroo jump away from Sandy Hook. This person, dressed in camouflage no less, was caught and let go because he said he was a parent and he didn't do it. He was reported to be Chris Manfredonia and his address, 35 Charter Ridge Drive, is directly behind the Lanza House. The 2D story from the LA Times is this. Chris Manfredonia, whose six-year-old daughter attends the school, was heading there Friday morning to help make gingerbread houses with first graders when he heard popping sounds and smelled sulfur. He ran around the school trying to reach his daughter and was briefly handcuffed by police. In the third dimension, the real world, why would a parent dress in camouflage to make gingerbread houses with little children unless he planned to run through the woods later? 
So I'm going to suggest here that certain players may have been brought into the real-world 3D setting beforehand to mix into it and create the event. Strangely, lots of people in the Sandy Hook story were new to town. New town. A great blog, sandyhooktruth.wordpress.com, tells us that many of the houses around Sandy Hook Elementary were bought on December 25th, 2009. That's Christmas Day. They are now sold up for sale and or foreclosure. The Parkers had moved from Ogden, Utah eight months prior. The Lanzas had returned. The Wheeler family was new. The Marquez Greens were new. The Hockleys, Manfredonias, and Hensel Richmonds were new. Even a caller to Diane Sawyer said she and her family were new arrivals. Newtown is known as a destination town. One reason was the Sandy Hook Elementary School, considered a vanguard school for its progressiveness. You will hear that parents moved to Newtown just so their children could go to Sandy Hook. In the 2D script, that only adds to the tragedy. But in the 3D setting, it may have a very different meaning. Newtown is what is called a transition town. It has its own transition website. A transition town is a place where community-led protocols help people become stronger and happier, especially in the face of crisis. So Newtown may well be a model town for America, with certain people having moved there for strategic reasons. Many of you are familiar with Agenda 21, officially revealed at the United Nations Earth Summit in 1992. Agenda 21 is a vast platform designed to move the world into uniformity and sustainability. The transition model described on this Newtown website calls for, quote, using our creativity and cooperation to unleash the collective genius within our local communities, which will lead to a more abundant, connected, and healthier future for all. So let's go back to dimensions for a minute. The way I look at it, in the universe, a speck, a locus, a pinpoint is the first dimension. A dot is a dot, microscopic, just marking a location in the giant infinity. In the second dimension, that dot has something measurable about it. Length and width, no matter how small it is. In the third dimension, that dot is a sphere, a tiny ball. It has a z-axis along with x and y, height, width, and depth. You could say that the third dimension is the static space where things exist. The physical properties of things in the third dimension are determining factors in their capabilities. Example, a man who weighs 300 pounds will likely break a chair made for a very small child. A plastic fork cannot pierce through a coconut. Jet fuel fires could not melt the steel frames of the Twin Towers. A lightweight like Adam Lanza couldn't shoot that many people in the time frame and with the weapons he was said to be carrying. The fourth dimension is physical space with something going on in it, an object moving, a series of actions that can be perceived. We could call it the moving, perceivable universe. Some also say it contains the property of time. In our diagram, the third dimension deals with physical properties. The fourth dimension incorporates the world of physical properties along with movement. Each dimension brings with it the last one and goes beyond. So the fourth has everything in the third dimension plus movement and the perception of movement because that's how we experience it. The third dimension is static. The fourth dimension is dynamic. Back to Sandy Hook. Here we see Lynn McDonnell, mother of child victim Grace McDonnell, giving an interview only days after her daughter's death. And with friends. And, and with, with friends, friends, people that loved her, and that's I think the, the whole community and the school and the teachers—they all, they're all raising your child, and exactly. it's a it's a special place. It is, and I take comfort that she was with all her friends, and I just envision all of them holding hands, and they're they're all together up there, they're, and they're up there with their wonderful principal. I mean, they they have so many people up there helping them, and uh, I said to somebody like. Just Sandy Hook, we have so many angels and so many bright stars shining over all of us in this town right now. You went to the, the funeral home, and you, you were telling me the story of um, she, had a, she has a white casket. She does. And uh, 
when we walked in the room. It was the first time we were, had been able to be with her. And when we walked in the room and we saw that white casket, it just, you felt like the floor was falling out beneath you and your breath was taken away. But earlier in the morning, I decided, because Grace loved art so much, we were packing Sharpies in our pockets. And when we got in, um, after we did our big family hug with Grace, we sat down and we busted out the Sharpies and we decided that we were, at first I had visioned maybe a little heart, but by the time we were done, it, there wasn't an inch of white. It was so covered with all the things that she loved and her brother, um, we wrote her notes and her nicknames and all the things that she loved. The Cupcakes, places we've been together. ice cream cones, lighthouses, seagulls and we were la saying she is laughing at us right now because our artwork was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now note that these are closed caskets. These were not open caskets at these funerals, except for one. So the father of Emily Parker was caught on handheld camera laughing as he stepped up to the microphone and getting into character like actors do when he made a public statement about his daughter's death. It was this video that got out there, causing so many people to question the identities and motives of the visible Sandy Hook parents, who seem way too complacent and accepting of the violent killings just days or even hours before their public interviews. Many have remarked on the absence of real tears, the swollen eyes, puffy faces, and red noses we should have seen. Crying, called lacrimation, is a physiological adaptation response to dramatic circumstances or a welling of emotion. There is a direct connection between tear ducts and the limbic system in the brain, the amygdala being the part of the brain that triggers physiological reactions to emotional situations. Crying is actually a coping response, releasing toxins and lowering stress. People lose composure when they cry, the need to lessen their emotional load being so strong that they don't care how they look or even behave. Fluid from the lacrimal glands, better known as tears, runs copiously, overflowing into the nasal passages. Heart rate increases, as does sweating, and the gasping reflex may be to regulate or increase airflow and oxygen. We are literally drowning in a sea of fluids. All in all, crying is often beyond our control, and when it comes to loss of a beloved, we remain in its grip for days. So here's the famous Robbie Parker video. It's not unusual in a situation like this. I remember at Virginia Tech, when I went out there, parents, loved ones, of slain young people wanted to remember their sons and their daughters, and as a result, they spoke and made a statement. Uh, so we'll see if... Uh, Robbie Parker, I assume he's going to come back to the microphones now and make a statement. Uh, looks like the family is there. And they're getting ready to make uh, to come to the microphone, so we'll listen in. Okay. So my name's Robbie Parker. My family is one of the families that lost a child yesterday in the Sandy Hook Elementary School shootings here in Connecticut. I've been contacted by so many people and agencies wanting to know how we're doing and I just thought that this might be the best way to, to share those feelings with everybody. First of all, I'd really like to offer our deepest condolences to all the families who were directly affected by this shooting. It's a horrific tragedy, and we want everybody to know that our hearts and our prayers go out to them. This includes the family of the shooter. I can't imagine how hard this experience must be for you. And I want you to know that our family and our love and our support goes out to you as well. Okay, now these are pictures of the McDonald's and friends with their mouths blurred out in live TV footage aired on December 14th. That inset below, you see the blurring. It's a close-up. Here is another close-up, both pictures from December 14th. You've got above 
the crying and the distress, and below the very same day, the smiles. Here we have Lynn McDonnell on December 14th, agitated, and then in her interview, only a few days later. What are we perceiving here? What is the fourth dimension telling us? The fourth dimension includes our perception, our experience of the third. So let's apply some perception to this. Parents who rush to the firehouse to pick up their kids are not dressed in professional clothes. Yet Newtown was a commuter town. No high heels, no suits, just sweatshirts, t-shirts, parkas, and jeans. Although Robert K. Parker, his full name, was supposed to be a physician's assistant, you can't find information about him as a professional on the internet other than that. And here, in his t-shirt and jeans, he looks like he's running in a 10K. Family photos of the Parkers. Here's one that appeared on Facebook. I call it the Christmas photo. Look at the two little girls in Robbie Parker's lap. What caught my attention was their legs. Look closely. Madeline, on her father's right knee, is sitting shifted to the right, and the younger Samantha is straddled. But where are the girls' legs? They have somehow been morphed into their father's trousered pants, father's trousered legs. Samantha's left leg appears to be there in white stockings. That's the little one. But her right leg looks like a napkin. Madeline's legs are simply not there. Robbie Parker's knees are too high and too big and too round. So what happened to the girl's legs? The 3D of this picture just doesn't work. So you have to ask, were those girls ever in his lap? Was that picture in a real setting? And if so, why is it altered? Here's another family picture, an earlier one, supposedly. If you look at the grass in the foreground, it's in focus until you get to the area in front of Emily, who is sitting to the left of her father. The grass is now transparent. Through it, you can see Emily's shoe. And if you look at Emily's legs, the positioning just doesn't work. How could anyone sit like that? It's supposed to pass for cross-legged, but the angles of the limbs aren't right. Her right knee should be up against Robbie's left leg, but it's not there. And her left leg is not attached to her body in the correct spatial relationship. So in 3D, was she ever there? Or has she been inserted? Here's another weirdness. Look at Robbie Parker's hair. I've given you a close-up. We're looking at an overlay of some sort. The Facebook Robbie clearly has thinning hair. Robbie in the sunset picture is supposed to be younger, and you can see a dark layer or mask added to the top of his head and the demarcation line between his real hair and the fake hair, or more hair for a younger look. And I did a little scribble in the lower right so you could see kind of what was done. Victoria Soto and Anne-Marie Murphy were two of the six adults who died. Not only are there huge contradictions in the stories of how the survivors of Miss Soto's class escaped, there are glaring issues with this photo, including the very low resolution, which is meant to conceal. Look at the disparity in the hands. Soto's hand is like a paw, with blurring to extend the sleeve. Hands are very, very hard to fake. They have so many small bones and folds of flesh that even the painters of old had to make them simple and smooth. The hand on the other side, belonging to Anne-Marie Murphy, is better. But if you look at the pixelation, even that isn't right. So let's go to Anne-Marie herself. We learn from New York Newsday that she was 52 when she died, shielding Dylan Hockley in her arms. Here's Anne-Marie in the first grade class picture on the lower right, taken in 2012. And on the left, you see her from a memorial video. Well, if she died in 2012 and they put up a memorial video, is this Anne-Marie Murphy, age 52, in both pictures? Is it even the same woman? The Soto family was very public about mourning Victoria. And let's look at a couple of those pictures. Can you see that these are all separate people installed together against a background of water? Notice the different kinds of rocks, the shadows going in different directions. You can see a straight line there between Victoria seated on a white rock with 
um, a lot of light reflected from it. And then there's a gray rock right next to that, an absolutely straight line in between. This is the Soto family at a table together. Victoria is inserted. She is staring into space. She is literally not there. Her eyes have a different focal point than everyone else. So, did she even know this family of hers? Adam Lanza is being called a kid who slipped through the cracks. The 2D story is a special needs child who became addicted to violent video games and guns. Let's stick with the 2D world for a minute. The press's favorite photo of Adam Lanza is Adam the young adult. It is so lacking in detail that it looks like a crude painting. Even the college ID from Western Connecticut State University isn't a proper photograph. The top right photo looks like a real boy from whom the more adult composites might have been created. Pictures of Nancy, and there are very few on the internet, except from an afternoon on a sailboat in a backless paisley dress. Comparing Nancy to pictures of the young Adam, they look like they could be related, mother and son. And here's older brother Ryan Lanza on Facebook left and younger pictures, which look a lot like the young Adam. Overall, there are very few photos of the Lanzas to examine. Internet searches yield very little in the way of information. Adam was a computer geek who left no internet trail. Neighbors say the house on Yogananda Street was a kind of black hole, devoid of activity. This is translated by the media to mean private. Nancy Lanza was private. She didn't let anyone come near Adam. Adam was antisocial, according to the 2D story. He didn't like to be touched, and he resisted change. Nancy Lanza, according to the PBS special Raising Adam Lanza, made the fatal error of moving him from school to school, thus introducing too much change in his life, and so he flipped. Looking at the Ryan Lanza pictures closely, it seems to me that the newest one does not belong in the set. That's the bigger one from Facebook. You cannot get that adult from that child in terms of physical maturation. The faces are just not the same. So the 2D story takes a leap here, but it's not enough to register with the public who saw this brother get arrested and learned that it was the wrong brother. Therefore, the other brother was the shooter. Isn't it amazing how the press is so quick to report the wrong information and then quickly correct their mistake? What this kind of error and rectification does is simply to underscore that there was a shooter, just like catching a suspect in the woods who was mistakenly thought to be the second shooter cements the story of the one and only shooter, Adam Lanza. Very skillfully, this is how the reality of the crazed Adam Lanza is established in our minds. This is how they shape perception. This is how they work the fourth dimension. Just out of curiosity, because I like to look at faces, here's Peter Lanza sitting with Ryan on the steps. Peter's on the left. Ryan is supposedly on the right. So who is the guy they arrested in Hoboken? Where is his wavy hair? Maybe there was only one Lanza son who has now disappeared just like his mother. Private investigator Susan Daniels has found no social security number issued for Adam P. Lanza. And the social security death index has him dead on December 13th, a day early. The Lanzas are one of the visible families who have moved off the stage and are completely silent, allowing the media to describe them and speak for them. Is Peter Lanza being protected? Is he a real person? Where is the outrage? Where are the YouTubes of parents who have suffered loss railing against Mr. Lanza? Instead, we see the transition towners extending condolences, vowing not to bear a grudge, creating new missions of love and strength in the name of their departed children. It sounds good, but in the fourth dimension, it doesn't feel real. If the fourth dimension includes our perception, Let's see what we think of this. This is Dr. William Begg again from Danbury Hospital, and I have shortened this video. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bill Begg. Uh, what's my inspiration for coming tonight? Um, I'm the parent of three new town students. Um, I'm a grammar school track coach. I'm the president of the medical staff here at Danbury Hospital. I'm with the newly formed group of uh, United Physicians in Newtown that formed in response to the December 
14 shootings. I'm the EMS medical director for Newtown and this region, and I'm an ER doctor that was on shift December 14th. Uh, what's my goal in the next two and a half minutes? My goal is to somehow convince you legislators that gun control measures that you hopefully will enact will make a difference. Um, the, the gun lobby hasn't allowed a lot of research, so I had to go overseas for research. In Dunblane, Scotland in 96, in Dunblane, Scotland, 96, and, uh, 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 29 first graders were shot. Their teacher and then the gunman shot himself. It, just a few years before in, in England, a 27-year-old with two semi-autic rifles shot 31 people, killing 16 of them, and he killed his mother and he killed himself. What did those legislators do? They, over a 10-year period between 88 and, and 96, I guess that's eight years, they enacted real legislation. What I'm asking for is you consider a stronger assault bans, uh, assault weapons ban, elimination of the sale of automatic semiotic weapons, restriction on the size of magazine clips, number of rounds, extend background checks, and also please let us do some gun research that's real. From the mental health side, So I'm not even asking you to add mental health services. I'm just asking you, please don't cut any more. Allow me as a medical doctor, when I see a patient or when my colleagues see a patient, when I educate them on the effects of alcohol or tobacco, safe sex, motor vehicle accidents, can I please talk to them about the risks of gun violence, please? What Dr. Begg introduces to a swell of applause is not just gun control, but mental health protocols, which, thanks to Sandy Hook, will undoubtedly increase. We will see an explosion of experts and social workers who will assess us, evaluate us, and permit us not just to own guns, but to own and care for our children. The media tells us that Adam Lanza had a sensory processing disorder. His mother made the wrong decisions. She produced a tragedy. The result of her mistakes took the lives of many other children, six adults, her sons, and her own. What could be more awful than that? If society had just been set up the right way, it could have all been prevented. If the fourth dimension is one movement and all movements as they happen one at a time, then the fifth dimension is the set of all movements of any one thing over its life. The fifth dimension is the past, the present, and the future. The push for increased gun control measures and mental health protocols is a fifth dimensional operation known very well to all of you as Hegelian dialectic. Problem, reaction, solution. Create a problem, the public has a strong reaction, and propose the solution. It's all about periodic results as we are moved slowly toward the goals so people get used to the increased heat and pressure, just like the frog who is being very slowly boiled. Now we can see why strict gun control was allowed to fail. We will have strict mental health measures instead, which people will not object to as much as they did gun control. We will see the merging of mental health with gun control in the form of more mental health centers, better treatment for mental illness, and training professionals to detect early signs of mental problems. In May 2013, the Palm Beach County Sheriff got a million dollars from the state budget for a violence prevention unit to train deputies, mental health professionals, and caseworkers to respond to citizen phone calls with a knock at the door. This is about acting on tips to prevent calamities like Sandy Hook. The goal, said Sheriff Rick Bradshaw, will be avoiding crime and making sure law enforcement knows about potential powder kegs before tragedies occur. It is the new tradition of good citizenry, the people becoming extensions of the agencies. We are all by now aware of the strange super coincidences of drills being staged wherever a reported disaster occurs. War games were occurring on September 11, 2001. Exercises that confused the FAA, whose response was not to send jet interceptors to the reportedly hijacked planes. Is this real world or exercise are the well-known words of an FAA official on that day. 
The Taft High School shooting that took place after Sandy Hook in Bakersfield, California, was a drill that went live. Somehow a real shooter barges into a drill situation and the result is catastrophic. How does this happen? What does going live actually mean? In the three-dimensional world, it means that everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. A shooter somehow got into a stage setting and fooled everyone. When 2D turns into 3D and the news runs with it, never mind that in 3D what the 2D news reports can't even happen. The public doesn't notice and doesn't care. And there's a new factor in the equation today. Because of interconnectedness, through very sophisticated 2D technologies, we have a virtual world in which there is no need to create real problems, when you can work with pretend problems and report them as real. Why create dead bodies when you can assume them instead? The most glaring glitch in the Sandy Hook story is the lack of hard evidence of dead bodies, especially as Dr. H. Wayne Carver, the state medical examiner, ushered in a bill in 2011 that prevents the release by his office of pediatric homicide autopsies to the press or public. I'm quoting him now. The office of the chief medical examiner and I are very concerned about the privacy rights of individuals being invaded by the curious public. YouTubers have pointed out the check-in sign at the firehouse. You could see it on TV. Was this for emergency teams and the press to keep track of who showed up and what they had come for? Was it for the hundreds of parents looking for their kids? It's an illuminated sign as well, clearly a part of equipment. Other YouTubers have shown how aerial footage of the firehouse shows people walking in circles out of one door and into another, through the building and out again. Without a destination I'm an ever spinning car Whirling around Till I drop Oh, but what am I to do? My mind is in a whirlpool Give me a little hope One small thing to cling to You got me going in circles Okay, if you watch certain people in that video, there's a guy in a yellow shirt. He just circles, turns around, he ambles without purpose. All of the people do that. They have their hands in their pockets. They have absolutely nothing to do. So I also notice that these people aren't talking to each other. There's no air of frenzy, no chaos. This is what you would have in a crisis. Everyone is just walking, circling. There was another aerial um, shot of the firehouse in which you can see something behind it out of general view. Somebody sent this to me and wondered if they were Christmas trees. In the first picture, with the arrow, it's hard to tell. In the second picture, where the circle is, it does look like Christmas trees. This was December 14th, the day of the shooting. On December 15th, a row of 26 Christmas trees, each dedicated to a Sandy Hook victim, was set up outside the firehouse to be decorated. If you look at this extreme oddity, the presence of Christmas trees hidden behind the firehouse and then put in front of the firehouse after the killings occurred, you cannot help thinking that the whole thing was a giant premeditated plan. 
The media told us that an out-of-towner had seen a notice of the firehouse Christmas tree sale in the Sandy Hook news footage and had stepped forward to donate the trees as a commemoration to the victims. And here's a question. If the firehouse was so people-friendly as to have a Christmas tree sale, why did the school itself have no decorations? Although there are strict federal regulations now as to what kinds of seasonal decorations are permitted in schools, we see nothing at all in the many windows of Sandy Hook. No snowflakes, bells, reindeer, happy holidays, nothing. In a town that has a Christmas tree lighting ceremony, why would the elementary school not have any decorations? The firehouse has nine bays and is much bigger than the one in Newtown. And I'm going to show you the firehouse in March with 26 stars on the roof for the Sandy Hook Elementary School victims. Here is a close-up of the flag outside the fire station, a green background with a six-pointed star made of 26 smaller stars. A plaque on the wall of the firehouse, which reads, Hitch your wagon to a star. This is a line from the poet Ralph Waldo Emerson. Hitch your wagon to a star. Let us not fag in paltry works which serve our pot and bag alone. Translated into the Newtown context, it appears to be a unity message. Let's not concentrate on just ourselves. Let's go far beyond. Newtown is the home of the Unity Project, headed by Dr. John Woodle, a Harvard psychiatrist. Dr. Woodle specializes in trauma work, including school shootings. An excellent piece on the Unity Project can be found on Dr. James Tracy's Memory Hole blog under the title Newtown World Order Religion. The Unity Project teaches cooperation, community resilience, and letting go of anger and blame. It is based on the Baha'i Faith headquartered in Haifa, Israel. Baha'i philosophy is about greater planetary vision and goals. All humanity is one family, harmony of science and spirituality, universal education, institutions for world peace. It also has big political aims, a world superstate, a world legislator, a world parliament, a world police force, a single world currency, a world taxation system, implementation of Agenda 21, and the Earth Charter. Here are Dr. Woodle and his wife at the December 16th Interfaith Gathering for Sandy Hook Victims, also attended by President Obama. This is a um, part of the sacred text from the Baha'i Faith. It was written as a letter to a mother who was mourning the loss of her child. I adapted it for this evening. Although the loss of a child is indeed heartbreaking and beyond the limits of human endurance, yet one who knoweth and understandeth is assured that the child hath not been lost, but rather hath stepped from this world into another, and you will find them in the divine realm. That reunion shall be for eternity, while in this world separation is inevitable and bringeth with it a burning grief. Do not languish, do not sigh, neither wail nor weep, for agitation and mourning deeply affect the soul, their soul, in the divine realm. That beloved child addresseth thee from the hidden world. O oh, thou kind mother and father, thank divine providence that I have been freed from a small and gloomy cage, and like the birds of the meadows, have soared to the divine world, a world which is spacious, illumined, and ever joyous and jubilant. Therefore, Lament not, O oh mother and father, and be not grieved. I am not of the lost, nor have I been obliterated and destroyed. I have shaken off the mortal form and have raised my banner in this spiritual world. Following this separation is everlasting companionship. 
Thou shalt find me in the heaven of the Lord, immersed in an ocean of light. O thou kind mother and father, thank divine providence that I have been freed from a small and gloomy cage. What I see here is the creation of a death culture, the shaping of a mass attitude of accepting loss, embracing hardship, seeking to climb ever higher and find ever more meaning in and from calamity. Newtown strong, Boston strong, Sandy Hook chooses love. The 9-11 chorus was, we will never forget. The chorus from today's survivors is, love thine enemy, we are all one. Let's get each other the right kind of help. These thoughts in and of themselves are admirable, but when they're born of a global agenda to keep the people calm and quiet as they suffer loss, they're a whole different ball of wax. We are leaving behind the competition over lifestyle and money and entering a competition themed around forgiveness and love. Who can be the most giving and loving? The Sandy Hook Fund and the Boston Fund have brought in millions of dollars, as well as a flood of toys, candles, and mementos. The outpouring is possibly another type of social engineering, demonstrating support and love in the form of material donations that in their own way appear to be a kind of capitalization. On the surface, it looks like thousands feel for the bereaved and are reaching out to them. But I wonder if this too is a show a show in 2D. Do you know anyone who sent money or gifts to Newtown? I don't. So, the battle for our minds has now become a battle for our hearts. What if Transition Newtown is a transition society model, a real live experiment in disaster with a built-in Agenda 21 social response, the coordinated behavior of public and professionals on all levels of life, including post-crisis observation and management. This is why you see a volunteer fire crew setting up Christmas trees. This is why holy people from all religions flock to Sandy Hook to bring consolation and counseling. This may be why the donation funds themselves were set up days in advance, another much-discussed issue among YouTubers. Sandy Hook may have been a momentous, game-changing drill, a new kind of 9-11, set on a smaller but much tighter stage. Watch this video. The town of Sandy Hook might simply be a CIA military intelligence nest, similar to the Langley, Virginia, but without the official headquarters, a town with a high concentration of members of the intelligence community among its residents. People here, we've also been reporting on the school itself, uh, David, and I'll just tell you that uh, uh, this is a very special school, and I mean that in the in the terms of of honored and uh, uh, an honored school, a school with where people in fact moved to Newtown so uh, they could go uh, have their children go to this school. In fact, the parents often had longer commutes, but they wanted to live here because the school was so good uh, and the teachers were so were had such a great reputation. People have remarked. <laughs> at the number of black and silver cars at the school and around the firehouse. Normal American families have cars of all colors, also SUVs and small trucks of all colors. Why so many government-type black and silver vehicles? And there's a report from a local that they showed up as early as 8 a.m. These are screenshots from a YouTube video of helicopter footage from December 14th that shows 68 black and silver cars at the firehouse. 92 around the school. That's 160 total. We all know the tale of the children who fled the school and came to Jean Rosen's lawn where they sat down and repeated that they couldn't go back to school, their teacher was dead. Over and over, Jean Rosen told news reporters this story, adding that he invited them in for juice and cookies and called their parents to pick them up. Everyone on YouTube was indignant about this demanding to know why Gene Rosen didn't call the police and how he could have been wandering around the firehouse in the videos if he was sheltering children at his own house. Well, here is a short clip from Gene Rosen that might explain the context of what was going on. And I, I came to the children and they were crying and wailing and mortified and there was a school bus driver with them and I invited them into the house, and they were just practicing. 
Then I found the very same interview with they were just practicing completely taken out. So this version that I'm going to play you is a slightly different arrangement and it also contains the mention of a skit. No idea. I thought they were doing a skit or maybe they were Cub Scouts and Girl Scouts and they were just practicing because they were sitting so nicely. So could it be that Gene Rosen was interviewed about participating in a drill with children appearing on his lawn who were also participating? And this is what he was describing to the news in yet another part or level of the drill, the practicing of being interviewed. In the editing room, lines and phrases from the interviews are shuffled around, and this is how the 2D story gets its quote-unquote witnesses. We can call this 2D plus when 2D goes live. It did not escape the notice of YouTubers that a black Honda very similar to the one found at the school said to have been driven by the shooter, could be seen in Gene Rosen's driveway. It had a towel over the left front window, which suggests broken glass. The wheel rims are identical to those of the Honda Civic towed from the school. Perhaps this black Honda Civic was used in an earlier drill at the school and its window was broken as the drills are designed to simulate real life. Now the Rosen house is right next to the firehouse and it's also on a hill allowing a clear view into the school parking lot. So could it be that the Rosen house was like a crow's nest, an observatory, a strategic center even for the event? A local reported that Gene Rosen was seen driving a black car on the morning of December 14th. And teacher Lauren Rousseau's car shot with bullets that somehow went through the school walls was also a Honda Civic. So perhaps Honda Civics were supplied for these drill scenarios. Large-scale exercises coordinate many kinds of groups, which in official language are known as partners. Drills are now regularly conducted in schools, including active shooter drills. They are large reality drills involving police, fire, EMTs, school staff, students, and even local residents. Watch this clip from back in 2007. This is an opportunity for the Connecticut State Police to take the training that we have and integrate it with other first responding agencies. In a real event, we would have these resources deployed. From students and teachers to local police, everyone in town is playing a vital piece in the puzzle. He's heading out to east northeast. The scenario, two armed men have stormed the building, injured students, and have hostages. Joining room, hold here. We join the state police's highly trained TAC team as they search for the assailants. In 21st century policing, the first responders are trained now to react to the situation. To not only react, but to actively get involved in stopping the aggression. This is the largest exercise of its kind ever put on in the state over 150 police, EMS, and firefighters. It's about everybody coming together, working together, and making everything go well and make sure everybody that is involved in the incident is safe. Please advise hostage has been recovered by EMS. Roger. And today, through this chaos, the goal is cohesion. It went almost flawless. There were a couple, couple bumps in the road, and you expect that in any drill situation, but it's a learning experience. As we know, the media is a major partner in these drills, which brings us to the tweet. Tweets, meaning Twitter messages, about an incident at the school were time-stamped as early as 6.56 in the morning of December 14th. The timestamps continue through the 7 a.m. hour and onward. Yet the Adam Lanza shooting did not occur until after 9, with the official police alert going out at 9.35. Libor Johnny, a reporter with the News Times of Danbury, Connecticut, which is a Hearst Media publication, sent out many early tweets on December 14th, which were retweeted by others, also before 9.35. His earliest tweet, at 6.51 a.m., was caught by a YouTuber, but is no longer on Twitter. According to tweets, Treadwell Park in Newtown was already being staged for press conferences at 9.30 in the morning. This tweet from Libor Johnny is timestamped 9.34, one minute before the official police alert. Media staging at Treadwell Park, presser, which means press conference, has been pushed back several times. 
It turns out that tweets today bear timestamps not necessarily referring to the time zone one is tweeting in. Twitter has become the platform for what is called crisis mapping. Tweets are analyzed to assess how people are responding to a crisis. The stated goal is to help people help themselves because emergency personnel cannot be everywhere at once. Fukushima generated thousands of tweets per second. 20 million tweets were posted during Hurricane Sandy. To analyze millions of posts referred to as human data computation, Twitter may be in the process of standardizing its timestamps. For if you adjust those early morning tweets by three hours, you get Sandy Hook happening in East Coast time. If you don't adjust the tweets by three hours, then something very weird was going on in Newtown. Dozens of government cars arriving at eight, the media reporting an incident that hadn't happened yet, staging underway for press conferences. Perhaps December 14th was a multiple drill day. And what if one part of a drill or one of the drill sequences was taken by the media and reported as live? We have seen a new town in the making, meaning that different people and projects have arrived to start a new world agenda. What if the reporting of drills as live events allows the same planners to observe and manage the entire country reacting? Government-sponsored science has already tricked large groups of people into participating in experiments, either unknowingly or for the betterment of the whole. Why not take a reality drill and report it as live in order to observe the multitude's response? Let YouTubers and bloggers go wild, let the skeptics write their websites and blogs, but make sure the participants know they are not to let the cat out of the bag. The famous warning by Lieutenant Paul Vance may not have been for everyone as we thought, but for those who were involved. Listen to what he says. One thing that's uh, becoming somewhat of a concern, and that is misinformation is being posted on social media sites. There has been misinformation coming from people posing as the shooter in this case, posing, using other IDs, uh, mimicking this, uh, this crime and crime scene and crime, criminal activity that took place in this community. Um, there's been some things in somewhat of a threatening manner. Again, all information relative to this case is coming from these microphones and any information coming from other sources cannot be confirmed and in many cases it's been found is inaccurate. So any of that information and people that are putting that information up there in any manner, all right, that can be construed as a violation of state or federal law uh, will be prosecuted, will be investigated and prosecuted. Notice that he says misinformation coming from people posing as and using identities of those involved. Thus, we ourselves are warned to question any challenges to the official story of Sandy Hook posted on social media sites if the poster claims a new town identity. Perhaps this warning is not to garden variety YouTubers and the general public, but is meant for the drill participants. Do not raise questions or you will be prosecuted. We are watching you. IPAWS stands for Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, a Department of Homeland Security program that includes something called Smart 911. Smart 911 is a connection network you can sign up to that collects your pertinent information, name, address, phone numbers, and information of everyone you include, your spouse, sisters, brothers, children, uncles, aunts, neighbors, friends, your clan. If any person gets caught in a 911 situation, the network dials everyone. It has everyone's cell number, everyone's work number, everyone's information. You will be notified immediately, and so will everyone you love. The Department of Homeland Security conducts large-scale drills to test the IPAWS partner network, which includes law enforcement, emergency response, hospitals, media companies, and even Twitter. As a partner in Smart 911, you may get a message from ABC or CBS that an event has occurred that involves someone you know. Twitter is an IPAWS partner with a major role in crisis computation, mapping, and management. DHS objectives for protecting us, stated in its documents, include biometrics or individual biological data that supercomputers will collate and analyze, clandestine tagging and tracking, surveillance in the form of hyperspectral imaging, 
and modeling, cultural, behavioral, and social modeling. This is where it gets so big, it's hard to believe what's going on. It could be that the horrific tragedies we're seeing reported on TV, with the identities of victims, shooters, bombers, the backstories, details, the emotions, and the histories, are all part of a giant management and observation experiment, a DHS grand-scale psychological, physical test series, in which no one is actually hurt or killed, but which yields a tremendous amount of valuable information with built-in, controllable variability, meaning turn the heat up, bring it down, and watch what happens. This is the creation of an artificial reality to permit the observation of real people in a controlled environment. I will repeat because this is very hard to grasp. They take an aspect of a drill, one of the drill events or scenarios, and report it as live. Everybody everywhere reacts, even the drill participants. I will repeat that. Everybody everywhere reacts, even the drill participants who don't know how the drill went wrong or what happened or who did what or how it got corrupted. Then the big screen, wide scale, real time, moving phase begins. The spinning and enlarging of the false scenario conducted by the media is a DHS experiment within and upon a culture. This is the training and testing that will yield information with which to produce the optimal future society. This training and testing will contain modeling and surveillance, tracking and observing using huge numbers of people. This is a DHS project for the benefit of the whole. The wide-scale test has to happen, for without it there is no known direction. Thus the second dimension serves as a tool to build the desired fifth dimension results. The third and fourth dimensions are the playgrounds which are observed as the testing is done. The fifth dimension contains the future. Our 3D setting and 4D experiences, and most important of all, the way we act, creates the 5D future. Now to FEMA itself. FEMA uses common alerting protocols called CAP. This is when multiple agencies go into motion. It can be a drill situation or a real life event. Full use of all resources is called a capstone event. A capstone event requires real documentation in alignment with respective roles. ICE stands for Integrated Capstone Event. This is the coordination of multiple courses into a combined event deemed by FEMA to be extremely important because it replicates what will happen in an actual community. Sandy Hook was a capstone event on an even bigger scale than mere team integration. So was Boston. The point is not that they made things up. The point is all about how the story goes down. It replicates or creates what happens in an actual community or an actual country, an actual planet, the world. I believe we are seeing extended artificial situations that are observed for years. A drill is a rehearsal to practice what to do in a future situation. In these supreme capstone drills, you see all resources in action using the third and fourth dimensions to mold the future. A pyramid is created with those who know the most at the very top in what is called the capstone, and the layers of resources below them know less and less. Here is Governor Malloy of Connecticut making a very interesting statement. Earlier today, a tragedy of unspeakable terms played itself out uh, in this community. Uh, Lieutenant Governor and I have been spoken to in, in an attempt that we might be prepared for something like this playing itself out in our state. So Governor Malloy seems to be someone at a very high level of the pyramid. Dr. Carver at his press conference behaved like someone who is not at the top of the pyramid. His nervousness and vague answers reflected knowledge of the artificial situation but no real control. Lieutenant Vance of the state police may be higher than Carver as you can see even by his expression and body language. The members of the press at the conference might be on different levels of the pyramid. Some reporters asked genuine, reasonable questions that Carver couldn't at all answer. Yet if the situation had been real and he had seen bodies, he would have been able to answer. His famous words, 
I hope the people of Newtown don't have this crash on their heads later, suggest that something abnormal was going on and might be eventually exposed. Towards the bottom of the pyramid are the people who know the least and are reacting to what the 2D story tells them. Those at mid-levels of the pyramid, some of whom may have played key roles without knowing how their contribution would be used, might be contractually silenced or intimidated or threatened in various ways. If things go radically wrong and you had a role in an event which resulted in deaths, you might well be terrified yourself. And all around the base of the pyramid, extending into the world, are ordinary people, millions of them, taking in the 2D information as they live their lives. These are the people the capstone eye is observing. This is the most difficult part of the story. The portraits look quite real, but there are a few very low resolution pictures. Who are these children? Are they alive today or not? Are we seeing pictures of children taken several years ago so it is harder to identify them today? That so many of them are inserted into what we know as the family pictures suggests they may not be present day members of those families. The only open casket funeral that we got any details of was Noah Posner's and his face was covered with a cloth except for his closed eyes. This was perhaps supposed to prove that there were real bodies and real victims, but we are again having to rely on the report and the appearance of something without being able to verify it for ourselves. In mid-May of this year, a curious development arose. The new town town clerk was refusing to release death certificates of victims of the Sandy Hook shootings, supposedly to protect against identity theft and to shield the families from added distress. Death certificate information, which includes mother's maiden name, has always been available to the public for all kinds of research purposes. To have this withheld from all who do not vitally need it, as the town clerk put it, suggests that there might not be any death certificates at all, and issuing a false death certificate is a violation of the law. Protecting the families has become a national concern. The lid on the case is getting tighter, with exploitation of sensitive information becoming a growing theme. Bloggers and the internet are being blamed. Governor Malloy's office also has a bill in the works that would allow only written transcripts of the Sandy Hook 911 calls to be released, preventing outsiders from hearing the mental anguish in the calls. Yet Sandy Hook children who got out of the building don't exactly show true mental anguish. Their descriptions of the shooting were not of gunfire, but of clattering, kicking a door, things being knocked down. Here's an interview of one boy with Dr. Oz. Second grader Louis, his mom Lindsay, and his grandmother I said, uh, Kathy. Grade, third. Oh, he's in third grade. Louis. <laughs> Thank you, Louis. Um, I asked all the kids what questions they want me to ask, because obviously this is a sensitive topic. So, Louis, you want me to ask you what you remembered from that day? Yes. I remember that a lot, a lot of policemen were in the um, school. Um, well, a lot, I was like, like, hiding under, when, it, when we were having a drill, uh, we were hiding under, like. Take your time, uh, there's no hurry. Go ahead. Um, Let me ask you, what, what would you like to say to your teachers about Friday? Well, I didn't, I don't know, but it's like. Wait, you appreciate your teachers? Yeah, I appreciate my teachers. And. Thank them for helping you. Thank me for helping, thank them for helping me a lot of time and stuff. So. Yeah, that, that's fine. That's perfect. Thank you. And of course, do it yourself investigation continues. I'm a avid Sandy Hook researcher. I found something that was kind of disturbing that I thought you might be interested in. Uh, back on the 4th, I believe it was, I called because I got to thinking, okay, if this happened, there would be blood everywhere. It would be a biohazard inside that school. Who cleaned it up? So I called the Connecticut uh, Environmental Protection Agency, and they were absolutely clueless. I guess this woman must have seen the line flashing, and she picks up. And she said, who are you holding for? And I said, I don't know. I said, I just, uh, whoever answers, who cleaned up the blood? And so um, they said, well, so she, when I said, whoever answers 
you know, whenever I hit number, I just went hit number one, and whoever I was talking to. So another guy picks up the phone, and he's different from the guy I've been talking to. And I said, who cleaned up the uh, the blood at Sandy Hook? And he said, what's your name? And then he wanted to know all about me. The first guy had told me to call Lieutenant Vance, or to call the Connecticut State Police. So I called Lieutenant Vance. And I told him he was being recorded, even though he really wasn't, because I don't have a recording device on my phone. But I said, well, because of your statement that you put out there saying that, you know, anybody who put out misinformation would be prosecuted, and since I don't want to be prosecuted, I'm recording you. So who did the blood cleanup at Sandy Hook? And he was totally caught off guard. He said, well, he, first he, he said, what blood? Twenty-six people died inside that building. Who cleaned up the blood, sir? And he goes, I don't know. And I said, yes, you do. And he says, you'll have to call the violent crimes unit. So I called them, and the same thing, totally speechless. So that's three state agencies who should have known, you know, something, and none of them knew anything, which tells me that there was no blood cleanup because there was no blood. This particular woman who cleans buildings professionally noted that even vomit in a public place requires certified janitorial handling. Blood, especially large quantities of it, would most certainly call for specialized cleanup, particularly in a society that considers body fluids to be so dangerous. When a photo of Lily Gobert was published as Allison Wyatt of Sandy Hook and Lily Gobert's mother set the record straight, why didn't the Wyatts speak out to say, this isn't Allison? Why aren't the parents of the dead children challenging the skepticism about the shootings? In looking at many pictures, I also notice that the children are wearing uniforms or very dated clothes. Are these photos from another time? The 80s, the 90s? The Soto classroom picture once again, boys in collared shirts, girls in dresses that small children wouldn't wear to school today. The children's photos all lack embedded camera information. They are scans, washed out and discolored from another age. And the Sandy Hook parents seem a lot older than the parents of most six-year-olds. Could it be that the pictures of their children are photos taken from years ago? Here are pictures of Neil Heslin, father of Jesse Lewis, when Jesse was a baby, which would be about six years ago, and a current picture. To me, Neil appears to have aged a lot more than six years in the more recent photos. So how old would Jesse really be now? Adam Lanza's name is listed in the Newtown High School yearbook with no picture, and the name Jesse Lewis is right under it. Were they contemporaries? If you work the Sandy Hook scenario backwards, starting with the presumed agenda set for our future, you realize that the children are a necessary concept or the hook in the dialectic, as are Nancy and Adam Lanza. A disturbed young man who murders 20 children requires a response from society to control weapons and monitor people's mental health. When you look at the residents of Newtown, there are quite a lot of heavyweights in the field of education, child development, media, emergency technologies, law, finance, marketing, politics, medicine, acting and performing arts, psychology, psychiatry, and community building. Specialties and skills that are being used in the resolutions and resurrection of Newtown after its tragedy. We are told people moved here for the quiet neighborhoods and the wonderful schools, but perhaps their very backgrounds were the reason for their relocation to a stage being set for them to act on. Older experienced professionals fit the going into action criteria better than the young inexperienced parents of six-year-olds. These are people who know how to do things, who have powerful connections and have mobilized. The school shooting tragedy was their green light. And so we're going to see and be involved in the way it all plays out. The future or the record of what will happen is in the fifth dimension. The infinite possibilities that might or might not happen lie in the sixth dimension. So it is up to us to reach into those possibilities and draw into the final record from the sixth dimension into the fifth what we desire, intend, and wish to create. We're all a part of that. We all have the power to affect that. Thank you.